Good morning, everyone. Uh, keeping up with uh, this week's theme that I have new background pictures, as you can see. So today we have a uh, Romeo. I hope I'm not uh, wrong in the name. And I want to thank Miss uh, Darian Blair for sending us the picture of her uh, lovely uh, pet. Uh, as always, if you're interested in sharing your pets with us, with all of us, you're more than welcome to send them to me. One more thing before I begin uh, to talk about today, and that's one final reminder because it's Wednesday today that on Friday night, Friday at midnight is the deadline to submit your midterm task. If you have any questions about that, you can try and yeah, you can email it to me. I will try to respond as soon as I can and just make sure that you are submitting the task on time, All right? Okay, uh, so let us begin. On Monday, I began a discussion about a whole new topic. The topic was international agreements and international treaties. Uh, we talk about the different types of treaties, the importance of ratification process, especially in terms of showing a signal for potentially for higher degree, higher probability of complying with the agreement with the different conditions that the agreement has. And uh, the main problem, of course, from the fact that we're talking about agreements in the international context is that there's no one party that can enforce. There's no third party that can enforce those kinds of agreements. So uh, showing or signaling that I'm more likely to comply with it is very, very important. Then I talked a lot about different elements that relate to compliance, but it is reciprocity between actors. We talked a lot about the prisoner's dilemma setting, the importance of reputation, and in many cases, why agreements are kept in order because countries want to uh, secure their reputation and not pay reputational costs and being viewed as violators and the, uh, all that in order to provide some kind of form of credible commitment to preserve those kinds of agreements. And then I gave you some details about different types. We talked about environmental regulations and the main problem those kinds of treaties face and that it's not just governments that have to, uh, to follow those kinds of regulations. It's also private actors which face competition in the market and then all the problems relate to that. Then human rights, again, is a very different topic which uh, does not involve the aspect, for example, of reciprocity, which makes it a problem, makes it less important. But still, uh, the challenges that those kinds of treaties, uh, those kinds of treaties are facing. And finally, we talked about in the context of national security. We talked about the laws of war, the study by uh, by Valentino and his associates that showed that the treaty itself, the treaties such as the Geneva Convention, which talks about the rights of citizens in wars not to be targets are not the main element that affects whether uh, uh, countries are, uh, whether armies are targeting civilians or not. It's mostly strategic decisions. And then also the potential implicit element that that has. If you have any questions about that, of course, you are as always more than welcome to email them to me. Today, we keep the discussion and continue talking about international agreements. And we'll focus more on the context of national security in the first part of the lecture. And then in the second part, we'll talk about uh, economic type of agreements. And I'll, this is uh, the same slide that I had from uh, Monday, just reminding you a little bit, just setting the background so we can talk more about international agreements in the context of national security. So international legal agreements are crucial for the different interactions between states. Those include both war conditions, peaceful conditions, any kind of security disputes, uh, all kinds of uh, agreements, whether they are alliances, peace agreements, territorial boundaries, all of them are governed by treaties as well as, as I talked about on Monday, the, lo the laws of war fighting themselves. And one of the important elements when it comes to agreements, as I talked a lot on Monday, is when you're thinking about it from a rational perspective, that's the difficulties for compliance, uh, the difficulties for compliance without mechanisms for credible commitment, because there's no one, there's no third actor that can enforce that. And treaties overalls are intended to help state signal a serious intent to comply with the agreements that they sign, right? And alliances are one example. The idea behind such treaties is that it is a signal that states will intervene militarily under certain conditions if war erupts. And that's the focus for the first part of our discussion today, that's military alliances. So let's begin with some definition. Alliances are written agreements which are signed by official representatives of at least two independent uh, states. And they include the promise or the promises to aid a partner or ally in the event of a military conflict. They also may include elements such as remain neutral in some settings or refrain from military conflict with another actor. And that, of course, related to different types. So, so we have five different types overall we can think about for military alliances. 
There is cooperation type of treaties, which can be either defensive or offensive. There can be neutral, neutral, neutrality, neutrality, I'm sorry, uh, pacts. I'll talk about that in a few minutes in more detail, non-aggression pact and consultation type of treaties. Now within these categories, it's important to account for variation in the content of the uh, alliance agreement themselves in order to understand what exactly are they mentioning. One of the central questions in the literature in this context, and that's the focus of all the discussion for now, is do alliances, does signing an international agreement and forming an, an alliance with another country help reduce the risk of war between countries overall in the international system? So let's try and think about the role that alliances play in reducing conflict by viewing those kinds of treaties, again, as providing information to the members of the alliance, as well as to the rivals of those alliances. And this kind of information from a more general perspective can either enhance or decrease the odds of challengers initiating violence, right? Because the type of alliances will matter, the information within the alliances, the content within the alliances will matter whether the challenger or my rival is more likely to attack me or less likely to attack me because of the type of an alliance treaty that I signed with a, another a country. And overall, alliances represent a heterogeneous category of cooperative security agreements that may have different effects on the probability of conflict. That's what we can learn from that. And again, the important element which we're gonna talk about now is the variation in the content of the treaty itself. So what information can we get from the treaty content? What can we learn that may affect the likelihood of conflict? Once again, the challenge when it comes to alliances is to secure or to ensure this credible, credible commitment. If I'm signing an alliance with a weaker country, let's say, let's call it country, country A, and that country now is going into a conflict with country B, can that country trust or be feel secure that I will actually come to help that country. Maybe I don't have incentives for that. And that's the idea of a credible commitment, right? And official military alliances, official alliances, provide information about the likelihood of intervention by other states in potential conflicts. In other words, the risk of a conflict turning from a bilateral conflict, right? So if I gave you the example of I'm signing an alliance with country A, which has a conflict with country B. So the alliances and the official alliance in this case Talk, tell us a little bit about the probability that the conflict between A and B, which is a, what's a bilateral conflict, will go into, will turn into a multilateral conflict, which includes myself along with A and B, right? So why do we even need a formal contract, a formal alliance between states? The main point, of course, is that official alliances provide information about the future intentions and create incentives for different types of behavior, right? Because if I'm signing the alliance with country A, I'm providing country A information about the future intentions that I have, and that's going to affect the behavior of both country A, my ally, as well as country B, the rival of my ally, right? And that goes through the mechanism, which I've talked about in more general when I talked about it on Monday, the different types of costs. We have uh, signals that can be either as a sunk cost by forming an alliance, I'm already paying a cost up front because I make some kind of commitment, or the anticipated future costs, which are mostly uh, coming as a reputational cost, if I'm fail, if, I, if there's a failure to fulfill the obligation, if now country A and B go into conflict and I decided I do not want to fulfill my obligation toward country A, then I'm paying significant reputational costs. And that's one of the reasons that I will more likely to stay with that. Now, these types of costs means also that the information within the, within the alliance treaty is a, rel a reliable type of information. We can trust that information. So let's talk about, uh, this is the work by uh, Ashley Leeds, who is one of the renowned experts when it comes to uh, work on international agreements, especially in the context of alliances. And she studied different types of uh, international types of uh, treaties, such as different types of alliances and how they affect the probability of initiating conflict or going into war. So the first type is what's called the mutual defense pact. And this is the most obvious type of alliances. And in this case, both parties that sign this type of treaty promise active military support in the event that one of them is under attack. So if A and B sign this kind of a pact, if A is under attack, then B promise to come and help. And if B is under attack, A will do the same. Now, I want you to think about that in the context of any kind of challenger. So let's say that A and B sign this kind of a pact. And we're also looking at country C as a challenger. Now, C wants to challenge B. 
Now, overall, it makes sense that any kind of challenger will initiate conflict when they think they're going to win. So if we're staying with the example, C is more likely to initiate a conflict if C, if the leaders in country C think they're more likely to win the war. However, once this kind of pact is in play, C has to understand, he has information that any attack on country B, for example, also mean that C will have to face both B as well as A, right? Because they have an alliance between them. They have a mutual defense pact. So this creates, in terms of country C, a deterrent effect and reduces the odds of conflict initiation. Facing these kinds of agreements, the expectation is that the, uh, the probability of initiation of conflict will be lower, right? A different type, as I promise you, is neutrality pact. This kind of an agreement includes a promise that under certain conditions, a state will not participate in a conflict on the side of the, the adversaries of the partner in which she signs the conflict with. So again, let's stay with the example of countries A, B, and C. If A and B sign a, a, this kind of pact, a neutrality pact, that means that A will not join C in attacking B for that matter. That's the idea behind this kind of an agreement. Uh, and now in this case, the information from this kind of pact provide means that a challenger should not fear any kind of outside intervention on behalf of the target. So again, if we're staying with the A, B, C example, if C wants to attack B, he should not be worried that A is going to help B because A and B signed a neutrality pact, right? And this may serve to encourage aggression since the attacker feels safer that it can attack without the development of a superior opposing coalition. As an example, we'll go back to the lovely days of the summer of 1866. The Seven Weeks War between Austria, uh, between Austria and Prussia. Before the war, uh, Austria and France signed this kind of an agreement, which ensured the neutrality of the French in exchange for territorial concessions given to France from Austria after the war. And then in a way that provided more motivations for this conflict to emerge. So facing this kind of treat, the treaty, the expectation again is higher probability of conflict. The third type is what's called offensive pact. It's an agreement which promises active military support in cases which are not related to attacks of one country. So again, if A and B sign this kind of a pact, it's unrelated whether A and B are under attack. It's mostly that A promises a military support for B if B decides to attack someone. And for an aggressor, having such support should only embolden, embolden any kind of incentives that, it, that that country has to initiate conflict. So again, staying with our example, if A and B signed an offensive pact and B had some incentives to go into conflict with country C, now that B knows that it has the military support of A, it, it has even greater incentives to go to war with country C. So again, the expectation here will be that face of an offensive pact, the probability of conflict will be higher. So what the author does for that paper, she collects, uh, for that research, she collects data on alliances from the beginning of the 19th century all the way through the middle of the 20th century. And she focused the test on the likelihood of conflict between dyads. Now dyads means two countries against one another. So even though she collects information about the entire international system and conflicts, she's focusing on the potential conflict between two countries. And that provides us with the more direct testing of this mechanism of the effects of alliances because every conflict that exists in the data for that matter uh, is being separated into multiple observations. For example, a war between the United Kingdom and Russia is viewed as multiple observation because on the one hand, it's viewed as an attack by Britain, the, the British against the Russians. And on the other hand, it's also viewed as a different observation as Russia fighting against the British, right? So to show some of her results, what we have here are the three types of alliances which I talked about. And on the y-axis, we have the change in the percentage in the probability of dispute, dispute initiation. So going into conflict when either one of those alliances exist compared to no alliances at all. So if we begin with the first category, which was the mutual defense pact, we see that the effect here is negative, which is just as the theory expected. Having these kinds of an agreement reduces the probability that countries will initiate conflict compared to having no alliances at all. On the other hand, having the other two types, whether it is the offensive alliance or the neutrality, increases the probability of conflict initiation exactly because of the different mechanism I talked about a few minutes ago, right? So let's talk about other elements related to military type treaties. 
Another aspect of alliances is the extent of concessions that are required in order to reach this kind of an agreement. In the study here by Johnson, and I can send you the ref if you're interested in that. Uh, no, I think that was one of the, uh, sorry, this was one of the things that you had for reading for today. Uh, the author, um, All right, so after double checking, Johnson was not on the real list for today, so you don't have to worry about that. If you're interested in the paper, I can send it to you. Um, anyway, what the author does in this paper, he focuses on the conditions that shape the formation of alliances, alliances, especially in terms of the extent of concessions that a state has to provide in order to form this kinds of, uh, of uh, in order to reach this kind of agreement with a strong ally. Uh, the study assessed the number of concessions that targets of disputes commit to when they form alliances. And the content of the treaty varies depending on the characteristics of both the adversaries as well as the members of the, ally of the alliances. Overall, just sorry, there it is. So overall, the typical view of uh, signing an uh, alliance treaty is that strong states form alliances uh, uh, are willing to form alliances with weaker states by obtaining policy concession from them. And weak, and weak members of the alliance have to provide those kinds of policy concessions in order to, uh, in exchange for security from the strong country, right? But there are also other aspects to that. One of the crucial elements that the this study offers is to look at the state's power relative to its challenger and how forming an alliance will reshape the distribution of power between those two adversaries, right? And that also has an effect on the terms of the alliance treaty. So if country A and B are two countries which are now engaged in kind of a dispute and there's some form of distribution of power between them, now country A comes into agreement to alliance with me, that changes the distribution of power between A and B. How much I'm gonna have to offer and to add to that alliance also matters for the types of agreement that I signed with A how much do I demand from A if I'm the stronger country in this case in order to provide A with the security umbrella that I can offer, right? So one way to model this process is to look at this as a bargaining game between the target state, again, country A in our example, and the defender. I am the defender in this case. So when we come to agreements about these kinds of, uh, of, these kinds of uh, treaties, we also address the extent of concessions that the target has to offer in order to secure the pact and to, in order to try to uh, respond versus a potential challenger. And this is what it's called, according to that research, is bargaining in the shadow of the external threat. That is the creation of an alliance happens when a target state, country A in our example, views itself under the threat of potential attack by external challenger. So country B is threatening to attack country A and the extent of concessions that country A is gonna offer to me will depend on target's view, on the target's view, country A's view, and what may happen if country A will refuse to provide any concessions to me and will not form an alliance, right? So if country A does, is not worried about going into conflict with country B without my support, then maybe I'm not gonna be able to actually get a lot of concessions from country A. But if country A is very, very concerned about going to war or to conflict with country B without my help as the strong ally, I may be able I'm more likely to be able to demand more concessions. Okay, so what the author does is he is the analysis uh, also of the number of concessions as well as the factors that shape those variations. So what you have here is all the data, 724 observations regarding the types, the different types of uh, alliance agreements and the number of concessions that were required in each one of them. We see that when we break it down by periods, for example, during the two world war periods, there is a lot of alliances that were formed without much of a concession. On the other hand, in the cold war period, but even more so in the post cold war period, we have, sorry, a lot of examples for alliances that were formed and required a lot of concessions. And the factor in this case are exactly the things we talked about in the, when we did talked about the different mechanism, mechanisms earlier. So for example, we have here on, the, uh, here on the plot on the left, the probability that the target state is gonna win. So again, coming back to our example, it was country A. What's the probability that country A is gonna win the conflict with country B? The higher the probability that, that country A is gonna win the conflict without my help, the lower the expected number of concessions. You see here, there's a trend line that goes down into lower number of concessions. 
At the same time, this plot looks at it from the perception of me, the strong ally that provides support. The more I need to contribute to that alliance, the more military forces, any kind of support that I need to provide, the more is the expected number of concessions I'm likely to demand, All right? So this is one way to show that how those independent effects of each one of those factors are uh, how the expected number of concession in this case is conditional on those kinds of factors. Okay, uh, I wanna talk about another example of international uh, treaties in the context of uh, national security and that's arms control treaties. Um, the focus for the discussion now will be what's called the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Nuclear Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty, which relate to nuclear weapons and uh, arms uh, control in when it comes in the context of uh, nuclear uh, technology. Now, overall, those kinds of treaties are intended to ban the use of certain types of weapons. Overall, arms control treaties, or to restrict its proliferation for other versions. And the overall objectives of signing those kinds of agreements is to reduce the odds of a dangerous arms race, right? When I talked about realism, near realism, and all those realist theories, we talked about the danger dynamics that can come up from a, an escalating arms race and the probability of war, right? So our focus is the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The treaty overall requires the countries that are signing the treaty to refrain from building nuclear weapons. They have to go through a lot of inspections as part of it. And it still allows five states, and here is the breakdown uh, across the entire uh, international system. Five states are allowed, are allowed to maintain their nuclear arsenal. So the five states that are parties of that uh, treaty and still allowed to have nuclear weapons are China, France, Russia, the United States, and the United Kingdom. All the ones in the blue on, this, uh, on the screen are members of the NPT treaties, which do not have nuclear weapons. We have his states that are believed to have nuclear capabilities and are not uh, official members of the NPT uh, uh, agreement. And we have North Korea as the country that was a member of the NPT and withdrew from that treaty, right? So the constraining effect of this kind of agreement fits with the common theory of international treaties as a commitment mechanism, because those countries that sign the NPT treaty, the NPT uh, agreement, face substantial demands in terms of its inspection by different organizations. And in addition, those that violate the treaty, such as in the example that we have here, we have North Korea, they face substantial risk when it comes to economic sanctions, as well as paying reputational costs and viewed as an irresponsible member of the international system, right? Regardless of the, uh, conditions of the agreement here, one of the central questions that comes out of it, does it actually help to limit the spread of nuclear weapons across the globe? And the argument of the authors of this paper is that we need to focus on the ratification process and that's gonna lead us to understand that when there's more rigorous ratification process, the extent of nuclear proliferation will be lower. Still, we also have to think about alternative explanation or contrasting explanation. Maybe those kinds of treaties are not helpful. Why? One argument suggests the strategic selection point. The strategic selection says that non-proliferation actually led to countries signing the treaty because only the countries that before they even signed the treaty had no intention of acquiring nuclear weapons uh, were willing to sign the treaty. The idea behind that, that it's not signing the NPT led countries to abandon their quest for nuclear weapons is that those countries did not have any intentions to seek those kinds of weapons in the first place. So they were willing to sign the non-proliferation treaty and get the benefits of this one. So the idea behind that is the NPT will serve under this explanation, the NPT serves as a screening mechanism and not as a constraining effect on the outcome for us, which is less proliferation of nuclear weapons. The second point is more uh, related to the institutional weakness of the, of the treaty. The idea is that the cost of discovery for violation do not exceed the benefits when uh, countries are facing risk of national security. So if I'm a country that faces substantial risk of national security, even if I sign the treaty, the cost I'm gonna pay for violating that are not gonna be higher than the potential benefits I'm gonna have from developing nuclear technology because I'm facing substantial national security risk. In essence, that means the states are willing to pay the price for developing nuclear technology 
because also because the guidelines in the treaty, and that's the institutional aspect of it, the guidelines are pretty uh, weak and enforcement is lax and uneven. In order to do a more clear test of this argument, what the authors of this paper suggest is we need to focus on the process in which states are selecting into membership in the treaty and the ratification of the treaty compared to other ratification processes. So what they do in the research overall is that they compare the ratification process for the non-nuclear proliferation treaty with other areas such as other arms treaties, human rights type of treaties, communication types of treaties, again, to compare these processes. They also account for different other factors, and then they estimate the likelihood after uh, testing this, uh, comparing those ratification processes, they also estimate the likelihood that based on this kind of processes, the likelihood of keeping with the commitment that the uh, treaty requires. <coughs> Sorry. Overall, what they find using data from uh, all the way from 1970 all the way to 2000, that if they're even after accounting for self-selection into the treaty, countries that want to join the treaty uh, overall, uh, there is a positive effect on being a member of the non-proliferation treaty and curbing the spread of nuclear weapons across the globe. These findings are even more robust for the smaller sample of states within the overall data that are more likely to pursue the bomb. Those kinds of states that face substantial national security threats and have the economic capacity to start a nuclear weapons program are not likely to do that if they go through a, a more thorough ratification process and sign, of course, the treaty. So that's the potential positive effects of a disagreement. All right, let's move now to talk about international treaties in the context of economic policy. So the question of this entire research agenda is how do international treaties affect economic policy action? different choices by political leaders in different countries when it comes to economic policy. So the first type that I want to talk about is what's called BITS, which is bilateral investment treaties. These are agreements that are signed between a host state and an external actor that provides FDI. Reminding you again, FDI is foreign direct investment. So this is any kind of an external actor in the international system that is interested in uh, providing external, providing a foreign investment, foreign capital to any kind of target state. And it's mostly prevalent for developing countries and different public projects or those kinds of uh, projects that are being supported by uh, those investors. Uh, so how does those kinds of treaties work? For the developing country, when they sign those kinds of an agreement that involves different provisions and it serves for them is a commitment mechanism which signals their intention to secure the property rights of the investors. So one of the concerns for external investors when they come to, you know, when they provide uh, money for those kinds of countries, because they're in many cases, as I said, a lot of those countries that are giving that are uh, developing countries, maybe there's gonna be any kind of violations to the property rights of the investor and the investor is not gonna be able to gain some revenues from their investment. So by signing those kinds of treaties, the leaders of those developing countries are providing some kind of a commitment mechanism signaling to the external investors that they are willing to comply with the terms of the agreement. There is an added, an added tool within those agreements, which is a, a legal mechanism to settle any kind of disputes between the party, between the external investor and the country. And those kinds of mechanisms increase the costs for the uh, government that may consider uh, reneging on those kind of, kinds of agreements and ripping the benefits of the external money. Overall, the uh, bits represent a valuable tool for leaders of uh, non-democratic countries to attract foreign investment because it's much harder for those kinds of leaders to convince external investors that they're able to make credible commitment. So if a leader of a non-democratic country tries to convince any kind of large international organizations or international investing firm to uh, invest money in their public project, they have to provide them any kind of commitment that they will not violate their rights. So overall, if you're looking at the data, it shows that signing multiple types of multiple uh, investment agreements, bits, right, increases also the extent of FDI. With both of the uh, plots here, we have on the x-axis, the extent of a foreign direct investment that is 
flows into the developing countries, into the non-democratic developing country in many cases. And that is also has a direct positive correlation along with the number of agreements signed, right? But at the same time, we still see here some variation. There are some examples for countries which have a substantial amount of uh, foreign investment flowing into the country, but at the same time, the number of agreements that they sign is not very high. So what we're trying to think about is use all kinds of different explanations to why those variations exist. One option is after, offered in a recent paper by Chain and Yi, and they offered to uh, look at a political account for these variations by looking at the incentives that leaders of non-democratic countries have when they sign those treaties and those incentives are a function of those leaders' perceptions to the threats of the survival of their regime. So the likelihood that a dictator will survive, in the, the regime of the dictator will survive is directly related to how much they're willing to sign those kinds of an agreement. The main point here is that leaders that view their survival as secure, so my regime, I'm the leader of country X, let's call it, and it's a non-democracy. I feel that my future is secure. There's no risk that I will be removed from office. I have incentive to sign those kinds of treaties and enjoy the benefits, but also uh, keeping the required commitment and ensuring that the investors also actually also get their part of it. And the main factors that the authors of this uh, research uh, focus on when they explain those kinds of outcomes is what's called time horizons. Overall time horizons is a central concept that explains the behavior of leaders in international politics. It's also the focus of my dissertation, by the way, but we're not gonna talk about that. The idea behind time horizons, it represents the view of leaders as to their expected time remaining in office, how likely they are to survive in their positions into the future, whether they are more likely to focus to survive in the short term or they're more likely to survive well into the future. Right, so there's a lot of things to, to understand about time horizon. I'm not gonna go into details. I wanna focus on the difference between a democratic regime and a non-democratic regime when it comes to the time horizons of the leaders. So in democracies, leaders that want to survive in their position to remain the president or the prime ministers face elections. So because they face elections and elections are scheduled regularly and they're relatively recent, even in the United States, every four years, relatively recent, that means that those kinds of leaders have to cater, have to satisfy the demands of their supporters. So they have a higher risk perception that they may lose their position. So overall, that means that leaders of democratic countries will have shorter time horizons. Why? Because elections are every two years, three years, four years, whatever types of democratic country you are, I have to satisfy my supporters. So I have to focus on the short term. I cannot think about 15 years into the future. Now. I have to think about the next year, the next six months, the next year and a half, right? On the other hand, leaders of non-democracies rule in many cases for life until they die. They are not subjected to any kind of public scrutiny. So they're not too concerned about that. And they're more likely to have long time horizons, right? So that's the main difference. Democracies are more likely to have short time horizons, the leaders and the leaders of autocracies are more likely to have long time horizons. And, but there are still variations within those two categories overall. And that's the focus we're gonna talk about. We'll talk about it in the context of foreign direct investment. And as I said, overall leaders of non-democracies, which is our focus here of dictatorships, are more likely to have long time horizon. But there's also variations between them. So overall, autocrats which have a more of a long-term view do not foresee any kind of imminent threat to their regime. So they have incentives to sign and comply with those kinds of treaties, with the bits, right? So they will sign those treaties. They will comply with all kinds of the different provisions within them, and they will enjoy the benefits which will substantially outweigh the cost that they have to accept. At the same time, there may be autocrats which have more of a short-term view. They're not that secure in office for whatever reason that may be. And I'm gonna go into that now. Those kinds of leaders are more concerned for their political survival and they're less likely either, either they're less likely to sign those kind of treaties or they're more likely to violate them. Even after they sign them, they're more concerned about their political survival so they will violate the terms of the agreement. The logic of short-term oriented leaders is that instead of allowing the property rights of the investors and allow the investors to collect the revenue from their investment, those leaders try to exploit the external income that they get from the foreign investment, distribute this, those additional funds to their rivals, co-opt them, and therefore secure their political survival. So it's similar in some sense to the uh, argument that I presented regarding foreign aid. It's 
those kinds of leaders receive external funding for their country. Now, the bits require them to keep the rights of the investors and allow the investors to collect the revenues. But because I am as a leader of a, of a non-democracy facing substantial rivalry or substantial risk for my survival, I'm using that extra money in order to uh, provide it to my, uh, co-opt my uh, opposition and therefore secure my position. Therefore, I violate the agreement, right? So they run a the bunch of tests and they show, and this is just one part of the uh, analysis they show, this is what's called survival analysis, I've mentioned that, that when we compare regimes which face high risk for a collapse, this guys show the potential for collapse of the regime compared to those that have low risk of collapse, the percentage of agreements that are not signed is higher for those that are facing high risk of collapse. So again, this is shows for that matter, if we're staying with the concept of time horizon, which I've mentioned a couple of minutes, which I've talked about, the uh, bright, a gray line here represents short time horizon. So that means higher number of uh, bits which are not signed compared to long time horizons, the bold line that we have here, which represent long time horizons. And there is a smaller amount of agreements which are not signed, right? All right, uh, before I go into the uh, final uh, part of the discussion today, I'll stop for today's attendance word. That's gonna be the word show. Show is the word attendance word for today. And the last topic in our discussion will be the role that international institutions play. So when we think about international institutions or international organizations, one of the questions we are, the, the main questions that come into play, whether it is from a research standpoint or very prevalent in many of the media discussions over the last couple of years, is why do countries have incentives to join those kinds of organizations? They require a lot of kind of concessions from them. Do they provide any kind of benefits? And we're focusing about that in the context of economic types of organizations. And when thinking about it, we're talking about organizations such as the World Trade Organizations, for example, right? So some of the benefits from those kinds of organizations that mostly endorse free and expanded international trade is greater access to the global markets, what's called MFN status, which is most favored nation status, which again, provides additional benefits to members of those organizations. The most important benefits that countries that are members of those organizations get is that because they are required to open their economy for international trade, they have higher extension, uh, higher degrees of overall trade into their countries, and they can get it more benefits, more income and revenue from more exports and better market conditions when it comes to imports, right? So the question in this context that the research addresses is, does being a member of organizations such as the World Trade Organizations actually promote global trade and provide benefits to those members. And the evidence overall from a lot of research that have been done, has been done over the last 20, 25 years is still mixed. So our focus in this case is the process of accession uh, to the organizations, the World Trade Organization. And this is a process which involves multiple rounds of questioning and a lot of different types of requirements that the countries that want to be part of the organization have to go through. Those requirements mostly focus on the need to alter the economic policy to fit with the organizational demands. And the primary demand in this process is states have to remove the vast majority of the restri restrictions that they may have on free trade in order to become a member. So for example, when Panama went through the process of being a member of the World Trade Organization, it had to cut its tariff base by more than 40%, just as an example. Uh, the main proposition that research has uh, proposed, has shown, has uh, presented about those kinds of studies is that the more rigorous the process of accession into the organization, the international organization, therefore there's a greater demand for a policy change. As a result, the potential benefits that this country will get from joining the organization will be greater, right? So a more rigorous process will mean better benefits. Uh, overall, there is different types or different degrees of scrutiny that uh, countries are facing when they go through this process. And the point here is that when there's more scrutiny from the world trade organizations, there is a demand for greater trade liberalization as part of the accession process. That should lead to uh, more trade benefits from joining the organizations compared to those that still want to join but go through a process which requires a lot less scrutiny. So there's a different also variations in the extent of scrutiny that is required from the countries that have to uh, 
uh, that want to join the organization. So first of all, overall, this is the breakdown of the different members of the World Trade Organization based on December of 2017, right? Um, all right, so the work by Ali and Scalera focus on the process of joining the World Trade Organization. They uh, look at the requ different requirements to being a member, as well as the duration of the process, so that also looking at the extent of scrutiny. And answering this kind of question, does going for this kind of process and being a member of the World Trade Organization provides better trade flows for those countries that go through this process. So answering this question is important because also there's a lot of debates around the globe about the effectiveness of those organizations. Just think about everything that has gone through over the last three years with President Trump, former President Trump, I'm sorry, regarding the effectiveness or the benefits for any country for that matter to being a member of those kinds of institutions. So what do they find overall? Uh, they find that those countries that go through an automatic process, which involves very little scrutiny, those countries do not get much in terms of trade benefits, right? Those that are engaged in substantial liberalization because their accession process is a lot tougher and requires a lot more scrutiny, those get a lot more benefit. So if you go for a more complicated, tough process of being a member of the organizations, the benefit you get out of it are greater. And that's part of the theoretical arguments because the process requires those countries to accept a lot more changes to their economic policy, open, the, open their economy to a lot more international trade. Therefore, the benefits of international trade are higher. At the same time, the vast majority of those benefits of the vast majority of this effect is limited to the short term. So this is the findings they have. Now, in terms of the implication of those findings, the positive association of joining the World Trade Organization, especially the one that for those countries that go through a more tough process, provides the leaders of those countries some form of a political cover for cutting protection uh, type policies, right? Because the leaders of countries that go through these kinds of processes, let's say, let's go back to the example of Panama, they had to reduce its tariff base by 40%. They have to sell those policies domestically. They may face substantial backlash or criticism from domestic actors for changing those policies because the act, those actors, those domestic actors were in support of the policies. So the fact that, especially in the short term, there is there are benefits from joining the World Trade Organizations provides to the, those leaders. So the leader of Panama can go back to his critics and say, yes, I had to cut the tariff base by 40% and that was a concession. That was a cost we had to pay, but look at the number of short-term benefits that I was able to secure for us by joining the World Trade Organization. At the same time, those benefits are mostly likely to be much lower over the long term. The other implication of that specific research is providing us additional benefits regarding the effectiveness of being a member of this organization and the, the uh, increase in the global trade flows, again, especially for those members that go through a more uh, scrutinized, high scrutiny process. So this is an important element in this case, but there's still a lot of research being done about that. Okay, so with that uh, additional research, if you're interested in reading, I highly recommend those papers. We have here even a quick uh, blog from uh, Todd Tucker, not from a long time ago, regarding to the actions that former President Trump has made about economic policy and being a member of the World Trade Organization. So if you're interested about, if you're interested in those topics, you're more than welcome to uh, click the link here and then go and read the uh, blog post. Uh, with that, I will remind you once again, the deadline for your midterm on Friday and uh, we have class on Friday. So if you uh, wanna join me and talk about any issue that you have any questions in, you're more than welcome to come and talk. And with that, I'm done for today and I will see you all on Monday. Bye everyone.